Okay, recording is begun. Go ahead and uh, get settled in. Welcome to the Manhattan GMAT Study Hall for November 3rd. Today we're going to be talking about remainders in the quant section, a topic that has been requested by a few people in the last couple of weeks. And then um, if we have time, we're going to talk about some more of the comparison problems that we didn't get to last time in the sentence correction part. So as usual, we need to start with a certain set of warnings and reminders. So let's try to get that out of the way as quickly as possible so that we can get to the good stuff. Um, okay, first thing, problem submissions. Here are the basic guidelines. If you've been to these study halls before, you will have seen these. The ideal problem submission is something that's not too general, but is also not too specific either. It's sort of in the middle. We need something that is general enough to make a, an appropriate study hall topic, so something that we can reasonably cover in its full scope, or at least in large scope, within a study hall period. So something like all of geometry or even everything on the test is much too wide in scope. On the other hand, and this is where more people go wrong with their submissions, please don't just send us one problem and ask us to, you know, about a couple of answer choices or just how do I solve this one single problem because that's why we have a forum. So if you have questions about a single problem or about a couple of answer choices on some problem, then please submit that on the forum. And finally, personal study plans, not really appropriate here. Remember that this is a recorded and preserved archive that's going to be watched by hundreds, if not even thousands of students. So personal study plans, it wouldn't really make sense to have 600 people watching one person's study plan. On the other hand, we do have a space for that that places on the forums under the general questions folder. So if you have questions about that, go ahead and post in the general folder and we will get to it. So as far as what we should see, topics of intermediate depth, not too narrow, not too broad, decent enough for a study hall type period. If you post a specific question, please tie it into something less specific please tie it into a more general theme that could reasonably be the theme of a study hall period. So any questions? If so, type them in the text box. If not, we'll keep going. Please don't submit official guide problems. I mean, our, our problem submission engine is actually already set up to reject official guide problems. I think it gives you some kind of red warning that you can't submit these, but some people have still been strangely persistent. Like some people have still been trying to submit official guide problems. So please don't. We can't use them. We can't currently use them on the forums either because GMAC has asked us not to. So if you submit an official guide problem, we will just have to ignore it. Apologies for that, but GMAC has asked us expressly. Um, Please don't submit single questions out of context. This is why we have the forum. If you want to just ask about one problem with a couple of answer choices, then please post it on the forum. Finally, please don't be demanding or rude. Um, as we mentioned last couple times, there may be a language barrier issue here. I mean, you may be writing words. If English is not your first language, you may be writing words that you don't realize would constitute rudeness in your native language. But remember that business is really all about personal relationships. So part of getting into this kind of scene is learning what constitutes etiquette and what doesn't. So keep that in mind. So, I mean, definitely things like I expect a reply or why has my topic not been posted yet or things like that are, are not, not okay to post. A um, couple examples of things of submissions not to do. 
This one is a personal study plan. As we mentioned before, this, this study hall is not the place for that. We do have a place for that. It's the general questions folder on the forum. And also, the other thing about this one in particular is that there's no specific question here. Like, if you boil this post down to its essence, it's basically, I had a hard time with the entire verbal section. Which we understand that a lot of people do have a hard time with the verbal section, but this post is far too general for us to make a meaningful response. So, when you post, please make some sort of question in your post that we can reasonably try to answer, whether it's a forum post or a submission here. Um, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about belonging on the forum. This is a single problem with no general question attached to it. This is just, I don't understand B. So please post that on the forum. Finally, tying in with what we said before about the general etiquette factor here, I mean, this is a, this is an enterprise where we get a lot more submissions than we could possibly use. Um, remember that we have one session every two weeks on one or two topics. And normally we get between 40 and 80 submissions every two weeks. So the vast majority of them, unfortunately, we, we don't really get a chance to address. So make sure you take that into account. Um, this, these sessions are pretty popular, and understandably so, because they are free. So um, the downside of that is that we won't be able to get all of the submissions that we receive. Finally, there's an archive. Um, this is relevant to a couple of you guys who have submitted things in the last couple of weeks. Because a lot of you guys have been submitting problems that are already in the archive. So that's fine if you are asking about a different aspect. So one gentleman was asking about percents. But we, we've already had a percent session. You can see the little tiny print right here. And this person didn't specify anything new that he wanted to cover. So we try to make the content new and different each session. So if you are submitting something that's already been covered, then number one, please watch the old session and see if your question is already treated. And if it's not, then please ask about whatever aspect. So something like, I saw the percent session, but I didn't notice any coverage of this kind of thing or this additional aspect that we wanted to look at. Because otherwise, we would be repeating things, and that's not, that's not great. So there's that. Any questions? That's it for the announcements. Um, if you understand, smiley face, please. The smiley face icon is located to the left. Over there, yeah, you guys found it. Okay, so in case any of you are newly logged in, today's topic is remainders in quant, and then more comparisons, if possible, in sentence correction. So there's a lot of remainder stuff lined up to go here, but in case we get through that more quickly than anticipated, then we have some leftover comparisons from last time. All right, let's do it. Here is here are the answer buttons. Remember how this works? You should see as of right now, you should see A, B, C, D, E answer buttons to the left. Um, smiley face if you see those. Okay, so you guys are seeing those, yeah. Um, those are what you should use to answer the problems that we post on the board. Please don't answer the question in the text box. That's not really fair to the other people here. Um, if you do have a question or some sort of query about it, then feel free to put that in the text box. But to actually answer the problem, please use these polling buttons. Um, don't click your answer more than once. The way the, the software is set up, if you click again, then it will remove your current answer. If you need to change your answer, then you click the new answer exactly one time. But if you need to, 
if you click more than once on the same answer, then your second click will undo your first click. So be aware of that. Okay, so let's do it. Here's the first problem. It's a data sufficiency problem, so the usual A, B, C, D, E answers apply. Here's a timer. Go for it. Okay, there's a few of you guys who don't have answers yet. Um, please try to answer the problem in the next 10, 15 seconds. Okay, if you if you are Anu Point Beniwal at Gmail, or if you are Omar, or if you are Siobhan, you still got to answer the question. Remember, this is the GMAT. You have to answer every problem. You can't not answer the problem. And if you need, to, if you just got here, please use these things to answer the problem. We'll wait about maybe five more seconds for you guys. Um, remember when you do this, if you if you just go ahead and leave it blank, um, Omar, Siobhan, I'm looking at you guys. If you do that, then you're not really preparing for the test you're going to take because there's no such thing as leaving a question blank here. You have to answer it before you move on. So here are the class statistics. So we have a lot of A's, we have a lot of C's, we have um, a few other responses here. The non-responses here are, are an issue. Remember guys, you have to guess the answers to these things because that's how this test works. So one of the non-responses is me, but there are still three others that should not be non-responses. Okay, um, let's talk about this, and along the way, we are going to get in a discussion of an important backup technique for these problems, which in some cases isn't even really a backup. Let's check it out. So what is the remainder when n is divided by 8? So let's take an overall look at data sufficiency, these algebraic type problems in general. In general, there are two different ways to approach these things when you have you know, algebraic entities like n and stuff like that in the problems. So let's let's just talk real generally about that first. In general, when you have data sufficiency problems about algebraic quantities, there are two ways to approach the problems. The first way is to actually use algebra or mathematical theory or what or what one might more generally call textbook methods. So theory or in general textbook methods. The other way is to use a, an approach of plugging in numbers which we'll, which we will also talk about. And in some cases, this, this, this method will actually be necessary. So both methods may be necessary. Either method may actually be necessary, depending on the problem. So in other words, you cannot depend completely on textbook style solutions to solve these things. You may have to use the plugging approach. So let's talk about the plugging approach first. 
We'll do this in the other order. We'll talk about the plugging first, and then we will check out some theoretical approaches to these guys later. So how does plugging work on data sufficiency? So we've seen this also in one of the sessions about a year and a half ago, but it's definitely worth looking again. How does plugging in work on data sufficiency? Well, here's how it works. I mean, remember, you got to remember what data sufficiency is in the first place. Data sufficiency depends on whether there is a single answer to the question or more than one answer to the question. So data sufficiency depends on whether more than one answer is possible for the question. So you're not going to find that out if you only plug in one possibility. So what you have to do is you have to plug in multiple possibilities that satisfy the statement you're using. And then if you get one answer to the question every single time, then sufficient. If you ever get two or more different answers, then that's insufficient. So this is plugging, the data sufficiency plugging method. The way you should primarily think of it is as an important backup if your algebra or theory type approaches don't work. But in a lot of problems, it's really the only way to solve. So it is something you have to know how to do. It's not just something that you do if your algebra is not good enough or whatever. So let's take a look at this problem with the plugging method first. Here's the problem. And then we move some of this information over to the next page. So plugging works like this. Let's narrow this down a little bit. Uh, sorry for the, let's see. Let's get rid of this and make it a little bit more compact. All right, so that's how data sufficiency plugging works. Let's try that on these. For statement one, the statement says n is a square root n is an odd integer. So let's check that out. Statement one. Given that square root n is odd, what is the remainder when n is divided by 8? So what we need to do is we need to pick values that satisfy this and then just see what answer we get. So we need to be organized about doing it, but that's basically the deal. So how do we pick values for statement one? Anybody know text box? Yeah, I mean, what probably the simplest thing to do is just to follow the directions. So if you guys came up with things like 9, 25, 49, good. If not, then you can get that through two steps. Just, just follow the directions. The directions say that square root n is odd. So take an odd number and call it square root n. So for example, square root n could be so odds, so start by taking some odds, see what happens. So square root n could be 1, 3. In case any of you are a step ahead of me, yes, we're going to throw away one of these possibilities. 5, 7, 9, etc. So the question is about n. 
n, not square root n. So the first thing we need to do is find n. And then we need to answer the question. The question is, what is the remainder when n is divided by 8? So if square root n is 1, then n would be 1. Does this possibility count? Do we have to use this possibility? Text box. No, we don't because why? Because it's less than 8. So remember, you still have to obey the conditions. So because this, the problem stipulates that n, not square root n, but n has to be greater than 8. So this possibility is gone because n is not greater than 8. So, okay. More possibilities. If square root n is 3, then n will be 9. 25, 49, 81, etc. So you got to answer the question. Well, what's the remainder when you divide 9 by 8? The remainder is 1. What's the remainder when you divide 25 by 8? It's 1. 49 by 8 remainder is 1. 81 by 8 remainder is 1. And you can tell there's a pattern here. Always 1. So after a while, you basically just throw in the towel and say, I'm just going to get 1 every time. So it's sufficient. I mean, this does not constitute proof, but remainders are very patterned, meaning like if you see a pattern in remainders, the pattern is not going to be a lie. Like you're not suddenly going to have something different happen after the eighth or ninth number that you plug in. But you should plug in enough numbers to be convinced of this. So that's how the plugging works for statement one. Statement one turns out to be sufficient. Any questions about this? Text box, please. Okay, no questions. Let's look at statement two. So, um, Omar, to be t to be to be honest with you, I haven't seen the labs in a long time, so I don't know what, off the top of my head, I don't know the CLA thing. Um, the, labs are, the labs are primarily intended to orient you to the, to the strategies that are required. So, I mean, if you, these study halls are mostly aimed at people who have taken the course and or studied for a while already and kind of have the gist of how data sufficiency works. So, it depends on your level of comfort with these kinds of things. I mean, criteria list answers sounds like a very basic thing. So if you if you need to label stuff like that to understand how the process works, then you should. But if you kind of intuitively get it after a while, that's good too. Um, okay, let's look at statement two. Statement two. Statement two is given that given that n over four has a remainder of one, what is the remainder of n over eight? So what's important here is that you guys know how to make this kind of thing happen. Does anybody know how do you make this happen? Like what kinds of ends will have a remainder of one when you divide them by four? There's a couple of them. Not all odds. Like if n is seven, then that won't work. Yeah, JC's got, you got to take multiple, I, I'm not literally looking for you guys to just throw numbers at me. I'm looking at how do you do this. So pick, yeah, a very important skill to create a given, 
to create a number that will give a desired remainder, you just take a multiple of the number you're dividing by. I think that's called the divides. But yeah, take a multiple of the number you're dividing by and then add this remainder. Super important takeaway. So um, Omar, remainders can't be negative. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but remainders are always positive numbers. So to make this happen here, To make n over 4 have a remainder of 1, you take multiples of 4 and you add 1 to it. So the way we organize this problem is you want to take n such that n over 4 gives remainder 1, because that's the problem statement. So that's what we've got to start with, numbers that satisfy that. Take those numbers, and then what is the remainder when you divide n by 8? So there are a bunch of numbers that give this remainder. The first few are 5, 9, 13, silly eliminate, 5, 9, 13, 17, 21, and so on. We don't want 5 because, again, 5 is not greater than 8. Actually, the first one is 1, but we'll, we'll get into that later. So the remainder we divide 9 by 8 is 1. But the remainder when you divide 13 by 8 is 5. What does that mean as soon as we get that 1 and that 5? It means we can stop. We're done. It's two different answers to the question. So that's stop. Not sufficient. So first statement was sufficient, second statement's not sufficient, so overall answer to this thing is going to be A. The main point here is the plugging method, and so the first thing that we're learning about remainders here is that a lot of remainder problems are very amenable to the plugging method. So that is first major lesson here. So this plugging method, especially for remainders, I mean, we can sneak a peek at some theory for that statement one here in a second, but the plugging method is especially well suited to remainder problems. Very, very well suited. Any questions about these two statements plugging? Go ahead and put them in the text box. So remember, statement one we showed was sufficient. Statement two we showed was not. Questions? Okay, just quickly, it's not really the focus of the whole thing, but. Um, I'll show you guys a theory-based way to look at statement one. So again, remember that it's given that square root n is odd. Given that square root n is odd, what is the remainder of n over 8? So if you're going to use algebra for this kind of thing, what you have to do is know what this means in terms of algebraic interpretation. What this means, among other things, is how much greater than the nearest multiple of 8.
same logic that lets you create those lists that we saw in the last part. So, I mean, if you if it is a multiple of eight, then the remainder is nothing. The remainder would be zero. If it's one more than a multiple of eight, then the remainder is one. If it's two more than a multiple of eight, then the remainder is two, and so on. So this is what that means. Smiley face, if that makes sense. That's what a remainder is. It's how much greater than than the nearest lower multiple of eight. So let's see what we can do with this. So given square root n is odd, it's a little bit awkward, but does anybody know how to represent a random odd integer in algebra form if you do a text box? Yeah, two, let's not use two n plus one because we already have n. So let's use k. So in algebra form, uh, odd integer can be written as two times integer plus one. I mean, I, I'm not, I, you can call it k if you want to. I'd rather just write integer because that, that at least reminds me that that's what, what it is. Like, the fewer new letters are in the problem, the happier I am with it. So if you guys want to use k, you can use k. I'm just going to go ahead and write integer. So statement 1 means that square root n is 2 times integer plus 1. So you can do normal algebra on this. So you can square both sides of that. Pardon the sort of not very visually attractive quality of that. Let's square both sides. If we square the left hand side, we just get n because n is positive. If we square the right hand side, we get 4 times integer squared plus 4 times integer plus 1. So n is 4 times integer squared plus integer. And then plus another 1. So, well, this doesn't look like much, but somebody tell me a story about that part. Just that part. Does anybody have anything to say about that? Yeah, this is even. So, the way you would prove that it's not necessarily a multiple of four. Like, for instance, if the integer is two or four or six, then it won't be a multiple of four. But at least it's even. So, because, I mean, you can just look at odds and evens here. There's, there's two ways to see this. The first is to factor it into um, integer times integer plus one. So notice that this is either odd times even. One of these is odd and one of these is even. So the product is even. Or the other way to see that is just to try the two cases. Just, just look at cases. If the integer is odd, then this is odd plus odd. So that's even. And if the integer is even, then it's even plus even, which is still even. Let's make those fit back on the screen. So either way, so you've got four times an even number plus one. But if you have four times an even, then that's a multiple of eight, because that's four times two times something. So n is some multiple of eight plus one. So that means your remainder is going to be one.
I mean, needless to say, this is a little bit crazy for the GMAT. And the reason why you might still see a problem like this on the test is precisely because you don't have to do this. Like, this is, this is the theory approach that you would want to take if you were going to use theory, but you don't have to because you can also just do that. So this should be a lesson, I mean, it should be an object lesson in the sense that if you, if your entire approach to this test consists of all theory all the time, then you can see what kind of disadvantage you're up against. Because in a lot of cases, the plugging is much more straightforward. You, ideally, you should be diverse. You should learn as many approaches as you can, and you should, if one of them, if you're stuck on one of them, you should just quit and try another one. Questions about this approach here? I, I don't actually know of a theory-based method that will let you solve number two. Like I think with number two, the only feasible way to do that is just to plug in this list of numbers and notice that you get two answers. So, any questions? Okay, if not, let's move on to something new. Again, the main takeaway that you should have gotten out of that whole discussion, there was a lot of discussion there, but the main takeaway that you should have derived from all of it was that you got to know the, the, the data sufficiency plugging method. So main takeaways from the last discussion. Number one, know the data sufficiency plugging method. Yeah, the more approaches is better. On many problems, certainly not all of them, but on many problems, this method is much easier than theory or algebra. And on some problems, this method is the only way to solve. Like some problems, you actually have to just list things and plug. And then on remainder problems, the plugging method is especially likely to be effective. Main takeaways from that last part. Any questions, go ahead and throw them in the text box. Otherwise, we're going to check out another problem. Okay, let's do it. Here's two problems. Let's take a look at these both at the same time. I mean, we're going to actually, well, let me cover up one of them. So go for it. I will give you, this is a little bit not as long of a problem, so I'll give you a little bit less time correspondingly. Maybe a minute and a half minute, 40. Okay, go for it. Regular data sufficiency answer choices. Have fun. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, try to wrap this up here shortly. Please pick an answer if you don't have one already. So, and remember if you just got here, this is the GMAT. Um, GMAT doesn't allow you to not answer problems. So even if you are relatively not clueful, you should still pick an answer choice and, and run with it here. So there's still a lot of non-responses. Um, Anu, Charnella, Sanjeev, Sylvia, and somebody who is here as just Thursdays with Ron. But you got to answer the question, guys. Okay. All right, we're going to move on. Remember, if you haven't answered the question, you, you are defeating the purpose of your studies here. So let's take a look. So if M and N are positive integers, then um, Sylvia answer with the uh, 
the answer buttons, these guys. So I think you might have just logged in, but you should see these buttons over there on your left. Please use them and not the text box. Okay, so let's take a look at it. So if M and N are positive integers, what is the remainder when N is divided by M? So let's take a look at plugging first. And then we'll go from there. So I think it's probably clear that statement 2 is not sufficient. We had one person put B. I think that must have just been a mistake. Either that or that one individual is not too familiar with the data sufficiency choices yet. Because this is not going to be sufficient because you don't have any information about that. So, and you definitely need information about M to solve this. Like, you can't find out a remainder on dividing by M if you don't even know what M is. So that won't be sufficient. Let's do plugging for statement one. So what we want to do is we need to pick M. It's probably easier to pick M first because then you can just plug into this formula and find N. So let's pick M, then find N, which is 7M plus 3, and then what is the remainder of N divided by M? Okay, so, well, we might as well start with M is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, if necessary. Okay. All right, well, if M is 1, then N is 7 plus 3. And the remainder when you divide 10 by 1 is 1 goes right into 10. So the remainder is 0. If n is 2, then 7m plus 3 is 14 plus 3. That's 17. This is 17 divided by 2. That gives a remainder of 1. Looks like insufficient. So we got two answers. It's pretty clearly insufficient. It's like one of you guys is typing in a text box. So if you have any questions about that, go ahead and ask. But this is proof. We, we got two definite different answers, so insufficient. So now what we got to do is plug for the, I mean, we don't need, statement two is definitely not going to be sufficient. So we should plug for the two statements together. So it's still the same kind of thing, the same process, but just reject the possibilities for which n is it more than 30. So pick m find n, which is 7m plus 3, and then what is the remainder? So pick m. So, uh, yeah, Maria's saying isn't the remainder 3 because of the equation. Well, I mean, look at, the, look at the examples that are right in front of you in the table. So, I mean, th th these are not wrong. I mean, these, these are definitely workable things. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the fact that 7 times 2 plus 3 is 17, and this remainder is definitely not 3. It's, it's 1. So what's, what's going wrong there is that when you're dividing by a number that's 3 or less, then this is not the nearest multiple anymore. That's, that's, that's the problem. 
but definitely when you're looking at hard values, you can't you can't argue with hard values. Like we got two different remainders, and so it's definitely insufficient. But when if n is if m is greater than three, then that's going to become an argument. So, okay. Um, let's take a look at this process here, and then I'll handle the rest of these questions. So pick M. So, well, let's go through these possibilities here. Remember, we have to reject the ones that don't work. Something we eliminate is being funny. Let's try it again. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if n is 7n plus 3, this is 10, that's too small, it doesn't count. That's 17, it's too small, it doesn't count. That's 24, it's too small, it doesn't count. Aha, 31, 4, 38, 40, 5, 52, 59, etc. So these first three examples don't count. Because M is because N is not greater than thirty. So here, let's just start doing this arithmetic. So here you've got thirty one divided by four. So that gives a remainder of three. This is going to be 38 divided by 5. That remainder is 3. That's going to be 45 divided by 6. Remainder still 3. 52 divided by 7. Remainder still 3. Et cetera, et cetera. The last possibility we've got on here is also remainder 3. So definite pattern, so sufficient. So this overall answer is going to be C. It's not good enough with the first statement, but it's good enough with the two statements together. So any questions? There's just one in the text box. I'll go ahead and address that. If you guys have other questions, you can type them in there and uh, get them in sequence. Okay. Um, so the people who marked A, what they were doing is they're looking at this and saying that, that, I mean, okay, I mean, the logic of that is that it's kind of like this where they're saying how much greater than the nearest multiple of 8. So if n is one more than a multiple of 8, then that's definitely a remainder of 1 if you divide by 8. The problem here is that this would mean that n is 3 more than some multiple of m. But the problem is that m doesn't have to be more than 3. So 3 more than a multiple of m doesn't mean 3 more than the nearest multiple of m. Like if m is 2, then 3 more than a multiple of 2 is actually 1 more than some closer multiple of 2. So, yeah, okay. Um, let me go ahead and comment on this comment, because this is a very common problem. So here's a couple of responses. The first thing is this. When I see that it's supposed to say remainder, I take it, not reminder, I immediately write blah, 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 blah. I mean, a couple of comments here. The the first and most important comment is, if this is the only thing that you do, 
like in other words, that you don't ever try anything else, then the 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 whole GMAT is purposely designed so that approaches like yours will not get the highest scores. Like it's actually the whole point of this test is that you need to think flexibly. And it's actually the main point behind the design of this exam is that a single approach will never be the only thing you need. Like, like, like the, the primary value on the GMAT is flexible thinking. Very, very important. Like when you see this kind of thing, you can't just mindlessly apply a formula. Because that's the point of it, it is for people who just sort of not think and just apply a formula to get caught. So, but if you just say, okay, I'm going to look at a couple of cases, then you won't get caught. So one person is asking, is there another formula that you should use in the place of this formula? That's, that's the wrong question to be asking. Like the point is that you can't always use a formula. And in a lot of cases, you just have to look at what happens in the first couple of cases. So there's not going to be a formula for everything. And that's, a, that's what this test is all about. They want to see if people can do lots of different things when they're faced with the problems. I mean, in quant, you can get away with more based on formulas, because after all, it's quant. But a lot of people take the same approach into the verbal section, and that's where they really crash and burn. Because if you try to solve like critical reasoning problems according to formulas, then you will never be able to solve any of them. But back to the topic at hand of quant, which there's not always formula. Like in a lot of cases, you have to plug in. I mean, again, this comment here was definitely not a joke. On some problems, you have to use the plug method. You really do. This is not. I, I, this is not kidding. So here, you. I mean, what you should realize if you're going to use that formula is okay. That only works if if you can have a remainder of three or more. But that would mean you're dividing by a number that's bigger than three. There's no reason to assume that. So, all right, here's the other question that you, um, can we assume that, no, you can't because the problem doesn't say that. I mean, what, what's going on here, let's take a step back and look at this. The answer is no. You can't make assumptions based on your steps. I mean, you can only make assumptions, the, the only things that you can assume are first things that are given in the problem or things that can be deduced from information that's given to you, not from steps that you choose to do. So that's the point. Like, if they told you that m has to be greater than 3, then, then you can figure that out. Or if they said that, like, when you divide by m, your remainder is 3, then you know that m has to be more than 3. But here, there's no reason to assume either of those things. And then one person is asking this, which kind of makes me think that you weren't paying attention to the previous discussion. 
But as far as I mean, as far as this question goes, the answer is you can. That's the point. You can't do it. The formula doesn't work because it's not suited to the problem. So the only way that you can do this is to actually look at these cases and realize that you wind up with different results. It's actually the only way to do it. So, and, and that's the point. I mean, and again, people who are looking for formulas for everything on this test, that's going to be a very big block to your improvement because that's not what this test is. Like beyond a certain point, the entire point of this test is for formulas not to work every time. So, but notice the beauty and simplicity of this approach. I mean, this is very simple. All you have to do is plug in the first two cases and note that they contradict each other. So definitely something that you need to have in your arsenal of methods. You've got to be able to plug. So, but that was my point in going back and highlighting this was that the only way to handle statement wonder is to plug. Like other other methods don't work. Any other questions? If not, we will move on to another one, which is sort of similar and sort of not. Okay, let's do another one. And Try this. Um, I made that one, but it's based on, it's rather closely based on something else that I've seen. So I can't say I made it up completely. Okay, go for it. Um, give it a shot. This one's a lot like the last one, so I'll give you less time. Okay, guys, remember statement one is the same as it was last time, so it shouldn't take you longer than this. So a lot of you still haven't answered it yet. You gotta get off the you gotta get off the chair here and give us an answer. Okay. All right, so good. I mean, you did already know how to handle the first statement because it was the same as last time. But it looks like one person still picked A. Um, maybe you were logged out of the last problem, but we the question and the first statement are the same as they were last time. So that's, um, yeah. Statement one is insufficient for the reasons previously discussed. Okay. Um, statement two. This time n is actually a multiple of m. So always. So there's not going to be a remainder. Like this means that M divides evenly into N. So when you divide M divided by M, there's no remainder. Remainder is zero. Plugging method. Just try a few cases. You can pick n, then find n, which is 8 times m, and then what is the remainder of that? So if m is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., then these are 8, 16, 24. 32, 40, and so on. Let me clean that up real quick. Dang. So when you do these divisions, you'll quickly notice what goes on. So 
the remainders that you get are going to be all zero. Those are supposed to be, um, they're supposed to just indicate those are vertical bars. And just make that a prettier vertical bar. It's zero the whole way. Every remainder is zero. So we're good to go. Um, any questions about this problem? Throw it in the text box. If not, we'll move on. Okay. So A to M is you can yeah, say this you can also notice that um You've got the words factor and multiple messed up there, so I guess I'll comment on that. You've, you've, you said factor where you meant multiple, which that's pretty important confusion because those are definitely not the same thing. But you mean uh, this is supposed to say multiple here. Otherwise, you have the right idea. So. Should say multiple, not factor. But the idea is right. The reason I'm I'm putting that on the board is that uh, yeah, that's a rather important confusion. Like if you if you made that confusion during an exam, that'd be a pretty big deal because a factor and a multiple are opposites. So watch out for that. Okay. Any other problems? Go ahead and put them in there, otherwise we will move on. Let's look at this. Right here. This one's from GMAT Prep. So go for it. I'll give you some time. Okay, guys, um, let's finish up here. The times a big the time is a big deal here too. This is a these problems here that are kind of short, don't have a lot of words. You should definitely be finishing these within that average guideline of two minutes. I mean if a problem's got a ton of words or if it's really involved with lots of stuff, then that's a different story. But these problems you gotta hook, go ahead and knock off an answer real quick. So here is here are the statistics. You guys pretty much nailed this one, so we will get through it quickly. Um, this is another one where um, uh, if you can't see the question, it's probably a tech issue on, on your end. Maybe try one of the, I think they have some tools on this program to help with that, but it's definitely on the board. Um, if you have a slow connection, you might have to wait for it to load. Okay, so this one, if Q is a positive integer less than 17, so in other words, there's not a lot of possibilities. So another major lesson for you to learn here, this is, I mean, the, the major lesson here doesn't really have anything to do with remainders either. The major lesson here is if you have a DS problem with only a few possibilities, then don't even bother with theory. Like, don't, don't even go there. Just list them. So it's like the plugging method, except it's exhaustive. The difference between this and plugging is that it's not really just plugging. It's actually exhaustive. So there's not a lot of integers less than 17 positive integers. So 
there's no reason to chance it with using theory here. You might as well just just go for it. So Q is greater than 10. There's only six possibilities. So only six possibilities in total. So just list them. So Q is, pick a Q and then remainder when you, remainder of 17 divided by Q is. So if Q is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. The remainder of 17 divided by 11 is 6. The remainder of 17 divided by 12 is 5. That's done. Insufficient. Statement 2, you have a power of 2. Also, very few possibilities. So just list them. So there's not a lot of powers of 2 here. If anything, you can k is. So k is. So q, which is 2 to the k, would become. And then the remainder of 17 divided by q. So if k is 1, then 2 to the k is 2. If k is 2, then 2 to the 2 is 4. If k is 3, then 2 to the 3 is 8. If k is 4, then 2 to the 4 is 16. Everything else is too big. So we just got to find the remainders here. This is an exhaustive list. So 17 divided by q remainder is 1. This remainder is 1. This remainder is also 1. This remainder is also 1. So there's only one answer, and so that's sufficient. So overall answer here is A. So again, I don't really think that there is a theory-based way to do this problem. Um, someone in the text box says 4, 8, and 16 only. Don't forget about 2. So. Q can't be, I mean B. Thank you for that correction. Um, Q can't be 1 because 0 is not, because uh, 0 is not a positive integer. Like 2 to the, 2 to the 0 would be 1, but 0, K can't be 0. So this is the smallest Q that works here. All right, um, let's move on unless you guys have questions. I don't see anybody typing, so we are good here. Let's look at these. Okay, this one I just wrote about five minutes before the study hall started, so good times. I don't really know how hard or not hard people will find it. So give it a shot. Okay, everybody, um, let's go ahead and get an answer up there. If you have to guess, go ahead and let it rip. Um, Sanjeev, Siobhan, I'm looking at you guys. Everybody else has some kind of answer up there. Okay. So, people's answers here, there is... Um, quite a variety of answers here. So, all right, so someone said this problem is like an OG problem. Um, I'm not sure what the point that you're trying to make is there. If that's a complaint, then I'm not understanding the basis of the complaint. And interestingly enough, the person who said it is, 
the person who wrote that this is similar to an OG problem incidentally got it incorrect. So um, that's also not great. But OK. So the question is how many, I, I mean, I think I know which problem you're talking about. I think it's the one with the division by seven of a few integers, but it's it's substantively different. I mean, there are there's some sort of relationship there. I think that's probably what I was looking at before I wrote this, because I can't use the OG problems. But um, it's different. It's not, it's not the same problem. So, OK. So you have 10 positive integers in a set. How many of them are multiples of three? So if you, OK, so consecutive integers, considering statement one, um, remember that every third integer is a multiple of three. So if you want to think about it like this, here's a diagram. So let's say that these are integers and the capital X's are multiples of three. So we have 10 consecutive integers. And the question is, how many of them are multiples of 3? So if we took these 10, then there are four multiples of 3 in there. But if we took these 10, then there are only 3. So this is insufficient because there's two possibilities. The blue set has four multiples of three. The red set has three multiples of three. So this is going to be two different answers to the question, therefore insufficient. So there you go. Um, you could also just plug in values if you don't like that sort of theory approach. You could plug in particular values. Yeah, if you do like the, the, the 10 integers from 1 to 10 or 2 to 11 contain three multiples of 3 which are 3, 6, and 9. The 10 integers from 3 to 12 contain three, four multiples of 3, which are 3, 6, 9, and also 12. So that's insufficient. Right. Now, um, let's see, well, that doesn't have to do with this problem, so I'd rather, Maria, so I'd rather not address that here, because it doesn't apply. Um, and you can see the, the, you know, the impossibility of memorizing formulas for everything, there's, there's just too many, but if you just look at possibilities here, I mean, it, it's kind of amazing the extent to which people will go to avoid thinking about the problems. You know, people will pull random formulas out that they spend hours and hours and hours and hours trying to memorize, whereas all we're doing here is just looking at cases. I mean, a lot of these problems, you can just kind of look at cases, especially problems about remainders and divisibility and stuff like that. You can just examine possibilities. Statement two, if each integer is divided by three, then the sum of all the remainders is nine. So, well, let's examine this. Let's look at statement two. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, so Ricci, that's a, that's a, if you're taking a product of three consecutive numbers, but there are no products in this problem, so that rule would be irrelevant here. Um, let's take a look. So, when you divide a positive integer by three, there are only three possibilities for the remainder. You can get a remainder of zero if the number is a multiple of three. You can get a remainder of one or you can get a remainder of two. So notice that if your remainders are zeros, then that that means you have a multiple of, of three. So let's try to make two different possibilities here. So we need the sum of the remainders to be nine. So ten remainders. So we could have Let's say we could have a two, a two, a two, a two, a one, and the rest would be zeros. So that means we have five multiples of three. Because each time the remainder is zero, that means you have a multiple of three. And if you want to pick actual numbers that will do this, you certainly can. just make numbers that will do this. So actual numbers in S to do this could be like 5, 8, 11, 14, and then maybe 4. And then these could just be multiples of 3. So 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. So that's one. We could have five different multiples of three. Or let's try to make as few as possible. We could have a bunch of remainders that are one. So we could have one, 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 and zero. So only one multiple only only one multiple of three. So again, if you want your actual numbers in the set, you could just make numbers. You don't have to, because it's really all that matters is the remainders. But if you wanted to find actual numbers that would do this, you certainly could. Like maybe 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, 25, and 28. And then you can just pick a random multiple of 3 here. Like Six. So that's not, that's in, that's insufficient. You can have anywhere from one to five multiples of three. So not going to work. Questions? Type them in the text box. Let's take a look at the statements together. Let's look at them together. So. I, I really don't think that you can solve this by using theory or algebra of any kind. I'm not aware of how you would really do that. Um, but fortunately, you don't have to. So let's examine different sets of 10 consecutive integers and look for a pattern. So look for a pattern, not really more than one pattern. So look for a pattern. All right, so let's check out um, uh, no, there's plenty of possibilities, but that's one of them, maybe. Let's see. So you've got um, 
10 integers. And then let's just find the remainders. And then let's find the sum. So let's say your 10 consecutive integers are 1 through 10. So then your remainders are 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. And so your sum is 10. If your 10 consecutive integers are 2 through 11, then 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And your sum is 11. And your 10 consecutive integers are 3 through 12. Then your remainders here become 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, and your sum is 9. And then what you'll find happening is a repetition after a while. If you use, after right now, actually, if you use 4 through 13, then you get those remainders again. If you use 5 through 14, then you get this set of remainders again. And etc. So everything repeats. And I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise that things repeat. Because after all, that's all that remainders are, is a whole bunch of repeating patterns. So 10, 11, 12. So this cycle will just keep occurring over and over. That's, that's not 12, that's 9. Um, this cycle will just keep happening over and over and over again. So same cycle will continue to repeat. So notice the only time you get a sum of 9 is when you have this set. That's right here. So all of these, the orange ones, which have a sum of 9, will all contain 4 multiples of 3 each. So that's sufficient. So overall answer here is C. So yeah, if you forgot to combine the statements, then of course that's an issue. Um, I think you knew that. But don't forget to combine the statements. OK, so we are basically out of time. Um, I do, I did make one more version of this that we're not going to go over in the study hall, but I can put it on the board and um, you can take it home and, and have delicious fun with it. Um, the, that one is this one. So try this at home. And then I'll give you two problems to try at home. I'll give you a little bit of time if you want to copy them off the board. So yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what the answer is. Um, yeah, I'll do that. I mean, I'm going to have to, because there's really no other way to broadcast it to the masses here. Try this at home. The answer to this should be, let me look back at my notes. I actually wrote this about three minutes before the study hall started. So um, the answer to this one should be B. So copy that down if you want. I'll leave it on the board for just a second. 
and then I'll show you the other one that I wrote. Okay, also a, a fun note if you like things that are fun, um, if you change the 11 in part number 1 to, I want to say, 12, 13, or 14, then the answer should become D like dog. So that's good times. Yeah. All right. So try that. Um, yeah, one of the remainder, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with zero. There is a remainder, you can have a zero remainder. The other problem here is th this one is modeled after. Is, there, is anybody who wants to copy this problem done doing that? Okay. So let's. The other problem that you can try at home is this one. This one is modeled after. Um, this one is very similar to. Official Guide Diagnostic Number 13. Um, in fact, this is supposed to be basically the same problem. We're just not allowed to. We're not allowed to actually reproduce the problems. So, so this one is very closely related. And this one should be D like dog. So there you go. All right, so trials at home, great fun for the whole family. And uh, if anybody has any admin type questions, feel free to fire away. Um, I'll give you enough time to write this down off the board. And Okay, so if anybody has any admin questions, you can go ahead and ask those before we close here. And um, there you go. I mean, but notice the one thing I want you to notice before we close is just how I mean, remainders are one of the topics for which the theory is the most frustrating. And non-coincidentally enough, it's also one of the problems on which theory is least important. Like, I don't think any of the problems we saw today required you to actually know how to do any of this algebraic stuff. And I mean, that's, that's what this test really is about. Um, this test is not really meant to favor people who know lots of obscure math and algebra and stuff. It really isn't. I know a lot of people have this unshakable impression that it is, but it's not. Like, this test is really meant to be accessible to people who, who are pretty minimally educated in actual math. 
like you know, only up to high school algebra geometry and so on, but who can just examine the situations flexibly. And one thing you guys will notice is that knowing too many formulas will totally get in your way. Because one of the posters here was pulling out formulas that, you know, that dealt with products of, of three consecutive integers, which have nothing to do with, with anything we were looking at. But the reason that's notable is that um, the, the reason that that's notable is that you know, it shows that trying to memorize too much information is just going to backfire. Like, because what will happen is instead of trying to understand the problems, you're going to just try to, like, look through a, a giant toolbox of disorganized information in your head. I mean, you, you really have to think about the problems and just kind of set them up and examine them and see what's going on. And if you memorize too much information, it will start working against that. So be careful. Um, I, I remember, we're not explaining these these last two problems here. Um, we've got to go. Um, if you wanted to post these on forums, I think you can do that. I think you would just. Um, I guess you would use use the general math folder. Um, and when you post, cite the source which is Ron made up this problem in the study hall. So you can just post them on the forums and the discussion can happen there. So um, same thing with this one. Sorry, this one. If you don't know how this one works, then post it on the forum. General math folder. Blah, blah, blah. Use general math folder. And then cite the source which again for this problem is Ron made this up for the study hall. Okay, that's it. Um, we're going to start logging you guys out here in the next minute if there are no further administrative questions. So, um, <laughs> so it's not to to maintain your stamina. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of answers to that, for sure. I mean, some some of it is practice. Some of it is maintaining your sleep. Some of it is eating right. Some of it is chemicals, caffeine, and whatnot. Um, you know, play around with all those things. Eating food during breaks, caffeine, sleep. You know, I mean, mess around with stuff and see what your individual set points are. It's going to be different for everybody. So things that work for one person might not work for another person. So um, studying, actual studying, you don't want to go over about four hours a day because that's where you start hitting the limits of human learning capacity. I mean, you can you can grind things out and you can take practice tests and you can like stuff like that for a little bit longer, but if you try to actually conceptually learn things for more than four hours a day, you're, you're kind of wasting time. And also, you need to make sure you take at least two days completely off per week. That's, that's important, too. All right. Um, let's quit it. Uh, we got to close here, guys. Have a great two weeks. Same time, same place, November 17th, and uh, yeah, have a good weekend, drive safe, good night, and good luck. <laughs>